Um, so welcome everyone uh, to the second of uh, ICTS's online avatar of Copy with Curiosity. We have uh, uh, temporarily renamed it as Curiosity during quarantine, KDK, uh, uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, since uh, uh, this is now the new normal uh, Zoom talks and so on. It's unfortunate we can't all gather together at the planetarium and uh, it would have been really nice to have had Gautam in person uh, interacting uh, there. But, uh, well, we'll uh, make do with the, uh, uh, with the technological tools that we have. Uh, I'm sure Gautam will be giving a very entertaining talk. Uh, but uh, let me, for, and we'll soon have Vijay introduce him, but uh, let me first just say a few words about IT. ICTS. ICTS is a new center of uh, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, and we uh, are based in Bangalore, as you probably know, but uh, we have uh, multiple mandates. Uh, uh, this includes uh, research, of course, as a part of the IFR. Uh, that's one of our mainstay for our scientists. Uh, but we also organize many programs, uh, academic programs in the theoretical sciences, mathematics, physics, uh, biology, various uh, areas um, uh, throughout the year. Uh, uh, and uh, it's a time when actually researchers uh, usually congregate from all around the world uh, to our campus uh, this year that uh, of course could not be but uh, many of our programs have now gone on to an online avatar and actually that probably helps many more people actually uh, to participate in it uh, but uh, you can check out our web page for some of the upcoming programs we are trying to have as many of them in an online uh, uh, format as uh, possible uh, the third mandate third component of our mandate is outreach and events like this um, and copy with curiosity uh, is one of our flagship programs and uh, we were holding it in conjunction with the planetarium uh, every month but um, uh, that has been dis uh, disrupted as i mentioned so uh, there uh, there we will also probably be organizing other public lectures and so on as we go uh, go on uh, on zoom um, uh, but uh, I think uh, our outreach organizers have a calendar of KDK events lined up. So uh, please uh, sign up for our mailing list or watch our webpage uh, for upcoming events. Um, so I think uh, that's uh, more or less what I wanted to say. And I'll uh, hand it over now to Professor Vijay Krishnamurthy, uh, one of our faculty members working in the uh, interface of biology and physics, uh, who will introduce uh, our speaker, Gautam. Uh, and I want to thank Gautam again for agreeing to uh, do this in this online format. Uh, so thanks. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Gautam Menon. Gautam did his PhD from the Indian Institute of Science uh, after a couple of postdocs at the TIFR Mumbai and Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. He joined the Institute of Mathematical Sciences in Chennai, and uh, this was towards the end of the last century, and he has been there ever since. Uh, right now, he's on Leon from uh, Math Science, and he's a professor of both physics and biology at Ashoka University in Sonipat. Uh, Gautam's research interests span a broad range of problems in statistical and kinematic physics. He has worked in the past on vortex lines in superconductors, but his current research interests are more in biophysics, where he works on understanding axonal transport in neurons, uh, the architecture of the cell nucleus, uh, problems in collective cell adhesion and cell migration. Um, Gautam has a long-standing interest in trying to understand the, the mathematical modeling of infectious diseases and its implications for uh, public policy. Uh, so this interest has been put to very good use during the current pandemic, where Gautam and the colleagues have been involved in the mathematical modeling of COVID-19 and its spread in the InSciCo and the ThoughtWorks uh, groups. Uh, so Gautam has been a recipient of several recognitions, including the Swamjanti Fellowship, uh, the Fellowship of the Indian National Academy of Sciences, India. Uh, he's a fantastic teacher and a great communicator. I mean, this I've heard many, many times. And so he'll today tell us about uh, soft and squishy materials and how to think about them. Um, so before I hand over to Gautam, a couple of organizational points. So we encourage questions, like in all our copy talk, we highly encourage questions. But for this online session, it'll be best if people can put in their talk questions either in the YouTube chat box or in the Zoom chat box, and Gautam will answer them towards the end of the talk. 
So I hand it over to Gautam. Thank you, Rajesh and Vijay. Um, welcome to all of you. It's fun to be at a nice ETS event, although a very different one, given that none of us are there really in person. Let me share my screen and then we can... Um, so this is a talk about soft and squishy materials and how to think about them. And um, when we think about soft and squishy, these are the examples that I'd like to have you keep in mind. This is an ice cream cone on the left-hand side. It's soft ice cream. The French fries and the little red stuff, which is tomato ketchup on the top, that's another example of something that's soft and squishy. And the toothpaste below is my third example. So I will give you a bunch of different examples, but I will spend a little more time on these three examples as really examples of what I mean by something that's soft and squishy. And I'll tell you what's special about all of these different examples. When we talk about materials, everything around you, everything that surrounds you is a material of some kind. There is, you can look at the tree bark, that you can see the sections through the tree, and each circular part of that is, is one more year in the life of a tree. And that's laid down in a very specific manner, encoding the history of the tree across the many years. The marble that you see below in this iconic monument of the Taj Mahal below is another type of material altogether. And both of these are what we would think of as hard materials. Now they take energy to move or to deform or change in some way. Going back to basics, when we think about this, we should remind ourselves that all of matter, anything that we see around us, is made of atoms. If atoms are empty space, and pretty much that's all that there actually is, along with radiation, if you really happen to be a physicist, but anything material is really made up of atoms. And that's a periodic table that you see in front of you. And it's an amazing sort of fact of life that this list isn't infinite. It goes on to element number 118 in this particular periodic table, but the last 10 or 20 of them are not stable. They have to be made in special labs. But all of the other stuff, one, two, three, four, five, hydrogen, helium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, all of these are what make up everyday matter around us. And all matter that we know of comes from these, essentially these types of atoms, the first 92 of them. Um, atoms go on to make molecules. So it's this the variety of materials that you have comes because the building blocks, which are atoms, can get together to make molecules. You have an, an ethane molecule below, you have a water, you have NH2 below on, as another example. But the infinite variety that is chemistry comes from taking building blocks that are, again, a limited set of building blocks, but figuring out this incredibly clever ways in which they can all latch on together to make complex structures. Molecules can be complex. For example, here's an example of a particular long molecule made up of taking many repeating units and adding them up one after the other. So the ability to create long and complicated molecules from simpler constituents is again another feature of chemistry. And all of the complexity of the world around us really comes from this. You start with the atoms, build up molecules, build up combinations of molecules in these long and complicated structures. I've shown you a linear structure, a line, a polymer, but you can also have things that look like ring polymers, you can have pom-pom-like structures. All of this is possible because chemistry is infinitely variable. The next twist is that the atoms and molecules, these basic units that we have to think about any matter, can be in different physical states if there are lots of them. And this is an interesting thing. If there's just one atom or one molecule, it makes no sense to say this is a solid, this is a liquid, this is a gas. But once they have 500, 5,000, 50,000, a million atoms together, then they begin to organize in interesting ways. They can organize together so that they're perfectly periodically arranged, that's a crystal. They can organize themselves so that they're still fairly dense, but they can move around, slosh around in the glass that you're holding, that's a liquid. And when you think about the, the third state of matter, is when they're well separated from each other at low density, and this is a gas. So the transition between the solid, the liquid, and the gas, for example, ice becoming water, becoming water vapor, is really, it's always the same molecule behind it. It's just that the organization of the molecule is different. The organization of H2O in this particular case is different in all of these examples. The questions that you can ask about any material are the following. How are the atoms that go up, go into that making of that material? How are they linked together? Are these simple molecules or are they complicated long polymer molecules? Is the material itself a mixture of different types of molecules? And to what extent does the mixture independently re reflect the properties of the different molecules that I put together? And to what extent can I make new types of materials by mixing different sets of molecules together? And then is overall substance a solid? Is it a liquid? 
Or is it a bit of both or something even more complicated than that? A solid, pieces of solid floating inside a gas, pieces of gas floating inside a liquid. All of this is possible. So let's get back to our examples again. There's the ice cream, the soft serve ice cream on the left, the tomato ketchup on the top, and the paste below. And let's ask, begin to query a little bit about how these things are put together. So these are all examples, as I said, of soft and squishy materials. And they're usually mixtures of different types of atoms and molecules. They often include long polymers. That's going to be a mainstay of some of what I will talk about. And they have properties that are intermediate between those of solids and liquids. For example, look at the ice cream on the top left. That looks like a solid. It isn't changing its shape. It isn't flowing. Whereas the ketchup that you see certainly has flowed when I took it and I put it out. I sprayed it on top of the french fries. And the way the, the toothpaste is coming out looks as though it's flowing out of the tube, out of the tube of toothpaste that, can, that, uh, that contained it, and flowing out onto the table below. So these are all soft and squishy. As I said, they're mixtures. They're often complicated in structure. They include both small and large types of molecules. And they have properties that are in between, in a sense, between those of solids and of liquids. So here's one extreme limit. And that's the limit of the solid, inflexible, crystalline material. And this is a crystal. You know that it's a crystal because it is a solid structure with a sharp faces between them with very well-defined angles. And crystals are defined by the fact that they have atoms which are perfectly periodically arranged with respect to each other. So the rigidity of crystals and the strength of crystals comes to some extent from the fact that these atoms are precisely prescribed. The locations of these atoms are precisely prescribed with respect to each other. And to change these locations on mass will cost you an energy because they then have to push them out to positions that they're perfectly happy with. And this is an example of a crystal. Interestingly, there are also examples that contain the first two words, the solid, they're inflexible, but non-crystalline. That's the example of the glass that contains this little liquid that I show you. And we don't quite know yet what goes into making a glass solid and inflexible, even though it can be non-crystalline. There's certainly no trace of any regular arrangement of atoms inside the glassy material, but still it manages to be solid and it still manages to be inflexible. And if I drop it from the top, it shatters into a large number of pieces. And the question is, why does it do that? Here's an example of something that is solid. It's non-crystalline but it's flexible in a way that I both the glass and the piece of crystal that I showed you earlier were not. This is plastic. I can take it, bend it, and twist it in many ways. It still retains sort of solidity. It doesn't sort of melt away in my hand, but it's made up of elements that are not crystalline, and it retains the ability to be flexible, which is something that my earlier example didn't have. Here's an example of something that is solid, but nevertheless, it's flexible as a biological material, and that's your ear. So you can take it, put your hand behind your ear, push it forward, and you can see how flexible it is. Again, this is not something that flows in your hands, but it's something that is amazingly flexible. I can take my earlobe and twist it all the way back around, or twist my ear down. As some of you in, in schools, your teacher may have taken you and twisted your ears around. That's something that they can do because this is a solid, but a flexible biological material. So biology has a large number of examples of a huge variety of materials properties, including both solid, flexible, and fluid types of materials. And I'll come to these terms a little later. So right here is the fluid. And when you think of fluids, you think of oceans, you think of water, you think of rivers. And that's an example of an ocean that you can see. And that what, there is an interface between the water below and the air above. But you can see that the water has its own special property. It breaks up into waves. Air currents can push it into little into eddies, into little surface waves that you can see on the top. And then you can have much larger, much more serious waves. For example, when you have slips of undersea um, continental plates, which can give you tsunamis. But again, all of that is a flow of fluids. And that's your prototypical example of a fluid. Here's an example of a fluid again, but a different sort of fluid. As I said, there's a lot of variety in how you can have one face of material inside another. So the fluid that you see here, the river, the mountain river that flows down from the mountain, is a suspension. It has little pieces of gravel, sand, bits of organic material, all of this there. And its unusual color really derives from the fact that it's really made up not just of simple water, H2O flowing from cold, just from a cold origin somewhere in the mountain glacier, but the fact that you have lots of material mixed up in it, and all of this together is flowing forward. So this is what I would call a suspension. When we talk about man-made materials, and again, I will come back to the ice cream and the, and the toothpaste, because these will be my examples. When you make something by hand, as human beings make it, you have to get their properties right. Ice cream has to taste like ice cream. The toothpaste has to behave like toothpaste. But all, everything that industrial research does that makes these things 
is to try to understand how to optimize, how to control the components that go into making an ice cream an ice cream and a toothpaste a toothpaste. And to get this right is often very difficult and that's what people who work in industrial chemistry, industrial physics, etc., do. Here's an example of a particularly flexible person. This is, this is a young girl bending down, putting her feet backward over her. And you can see that this is something that a solid material would not do. You can't take a piece of crystal and have it bend forward and come back to its old position later. This is something that human bodies, in fact, all biological materials seem to be somewhat specially able to do. There are parts of them that are hard, that are very rigid and solid, for example, like bones. But there are parts of them that are soft and fluid, for example, like the cells that go up into making your body. You can make some of this, of course, with regular material. This is a bendy toy. And you can see that the bendy toy, you can twist, you can move its hand. For those of you who played with this, you can move its hands around, get it to shift into a different position. That has the same sort of articulation that the earlier example had that I showed you. But it's a bit of a miracle in a sense that these materials that can actually bend are very different from the bendy toys that I showed you earlier because they grow. So flexible living materials can also grow. They can grow from being the flexible baby that you see on the top left of the slide into something like the flexible adult that you see on the bottom right of the slide. So all of the information that goes into making the adult on the bottom right hand side is there contained in the baby. The baby contains a blueprint of everything that the adult is going to become in terms of body size, body specification, parts of its intelligence, all of this is there inside the baby. So it's not just a question of materials, but the fact that biological materials are flexible, they're living materials, they can grow, and they also encode information at many different levels. Your hand knows that it has to become a hand. It has to stay from being a small hand in the babies to being a large, grown-up, adult, muscular hand in the, when, it, when it grows to become adult size. So the combination of biological softness, flexibility that living matter has with the fact that it has to contain information that encodes how you go from a baby to an adult is really very specific to biology. And we have not figured out any way of making a synthetic or a man-made material can actually do the same thing. Having talked about these examples, let's get, just dive a little bit deeper into what makes something soft, squishy, and flexible. And to do that, we'll have to talk about how you change the shape of something. And so the word of importance here, the word that's really used here is something called a deformation. A deformation is something that is a change of shape. You can have materials that do different things when you attempt to impose a change of shape on them. You can have materials that resist that change of shape. And you can have materials that are easy to deform, that welcome a change of shape. So materials that resist having their shape change are the examples that I showed you here is sort of large metal bar that you can see. And whatever you do with your strength and my strength, there is no way we're going to take that metal bar and bend it in any significant way. In the example to the right, you can see a bunch of stones. Again, very, very hard to change the shape of these stones. The fact that these have nice rounded edges really reflects the fact that they have been in underwater for a long time. So the gradual process of erosion of their surfaces through all of the, the material that I said, the grains of sand that is carried along in the suspension that is river water has served to smooth these edges to get them in the round sort of oval shapes that they actually have. But it's taken a lot of time to do that. And certainly something that I would not be able to do with my strength. And then you can go to materials whose shape you can easily change. So that's an example on the left of children playing. It's foam in a sort of foam shower inside and they can jump around, run around, move their hands around, and the foam will move around. It will still stay there. But that's something whose shape you can change with just a sort of moving your hand back and forth. The piece of, of sponge that you see on the top right-hand corner, that's again something you can depress and will relax again to its old shape. And the example below that you see is the example of plasticine. And that's, that's again an example of something that you can pull at, change its shape, deform, twist up in various different ways. All of these are materials whose shape you can change easily. So to deform the big metal bars that I showed you earlier, it takes something like that big muscular figure that you see on the left, the incredible hulk in this particular example, to be able to deform the structure that I show you there, to just deform the metal bar. But soft and squishy materials don't need, we could call it hulk level forces to actually deform them. And then you can ask, how big should these forces be? And the answer is, the softer the material, the less the force that you need to apply to be able to deform it, to be able to change its shape. So here are examples of what are called soft materials. 
Examples to the left, both to the left and the right, is something called slime. And you can buy slime in kits that you can get, mix it together with water, and then use that structure to, to make all sorts of shapes that flow in interesting ways. The example to the right is what you have if you take slime, you drape it over a glass, and you leave it for a while. Just under the action of gravity, the, the slime will flow down. And after a while, the slime will go and reach the top of the table and it will flow off again. So this is an interesting example of something that looks kind of solid. I can manipulate it, but it flows like a liquid, although fairly slowly. So here's one useful word. And I will use uh, three or four slightly technical sounding words. But believe me, they're not going to be very difficult to think about. They're going to be fairly straightforward. And you will understand completely what they mean from their colloquial usage. So elasticity refers to materials that have a preference for a certain shape, and they want to return to that shape if you begin to deform them. So let's look at some examples of elastic materials. So the example of the sponge that you see is an example of something that goes back to its old shape after you deform it. So you can see the sponge filled with water. You have now squished it out, pushed the water out, release your hand, the sponge will go back to looking like the sponge that I had in this particular example, the top right of that example there. You look at the sponges to the right. These are, again, examples of things that get heavier when they're suffused with water. But all you do is just squish the water out, and it goes back to the old state that it had previously. A rubber band is another example of something that you can pull at, release, and it goes back to its old shape. If you pull it at too much, or if you pull it at so that it, it, it's beyond a certain limit, then it doesn't go back to the old phase. But for small pulls, a rubber band goes back more or less to where it actually started out. So the word elasticity is often referred to together with the word rubber, rubber elasticity, because this is a prototypical example of something that returns or snaps back to its old shape once you release the force that you have applied to it. The word plasticity is a word that is applied in a similar context. Again, this is a material that has some original shape. I wouldn't call it a natural shape, although I've used that word. It's some original shape that I had to start out with. If I moved it a little bit, if I put a small little force on it, it changes, it deforms slightly, but could still potentially go back. So for small deformations, these are typically materials that go back to the earlier shapes. But if I deform them considerably, if I pull at them large enough, then they will not change shape back to what they were initially. And so here's one example of something of a strong gentleman who's taken a piece of metal, a metal rod, deformed it into a circular shape here. And now it was not possible to take this back to its old shape. It doesn't go naturally back into its own shape, although I'm sure with the use of a foot and a hand, you could move it back. But then that takes more work, more effort. It's not as though it's naturally snapping back to its old shape, like the, like the example of the rubber band that I had earlier. Fluids are a different category altogether. So now we've talked about solid materials, things that were soft. Now we're going to talk about the limits of things that flow, that are really one extreme, very far away from the solid. And these are materials that have no natural shape. These are materials that take the shape of the container into which you pour them. So here is a glass into which I poured some sort of material. I'm gradually filling up the glass. And as I go on in time, more and more of the glass is filled up. But it takes the shape of that glass. It's not as though I take, a, a, for example, a sugar cube and I drop it into the glass. The sugar cube will maintain its, its shape. It doesn't take the shape of the container that actually holds it. So fluids have no, in quotes, natural shape. They take the shape of the container they're in. So then the question could be, what does it even mean to deform something that is fluid? When, you, when a fluid is perfectly happy to change its shape anyway, it can take the shape of any container that I actually decide to pour it into. So fluids are happy to adapt to any shape that you impose on them. So deforming them is completely fine by, by way of the fluid. What matters is how fast you deform the fluid. And I'm using the word deform in a somewhat informal sense. There's a proper physics way in which I should use the word deform, but I'm not going to do it here because I want this to remain at a level that everyone can understand the words and the terms that I want to use. So what I want to say is that fluids really don't like their shape change fast. The faster you attempt to change their shape, the more they resist that change. Where do changes of shape come from in the first place? Every change of shape involves molecules moving relative to other molecules. And for liquids, different parts of the liquid don't like to move relative to other parts. It's not as though this part of the liquid wants to move much faster than this part of the liquid. What quantifies the resistance of a fluid, of a liquid, I will use the word fluid and liquid interchangeably. What quantifies the resistance to having different parts of them move with different speeds is something called a viscosity. So one example here is water and honey. 
both are liquids of very different viscosity. As anyone who has attempted to take out a spoon of honey from, from, from a bottle will actually know. It doesn't flow like water. It flows very, very differently. Here's another example of viscosity where you take different types of materials, in this case, engine oils, and then you can drop a ball through them. The more the viscosity of the oil, the slower the ball falls through this particular setup. So that's one practical way of, of trying to figure out what is the number that I should measure a viscosity in, or it is related to the number at which, the speed at which the ball falls through a container that contains liquid of that particular viscosity that I want to test. Here's a somewhat unique example of really taking the drop example that I, that I imposed, the, 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 the drop example of uh, asking how long it takes for a drop to fall. And this is an example that takes pitch which flows very, very, very slowly. And the experiment consists of watching it for many, many, many years on end and asking when does each drop of this pitch falls. So two years after the seventh drop, the seventh drop was taken in, 19, in, in, in 1988. And that was 10 years before the eighth drop fell. So that, the time between drops can be something like eight to 10 years before it actually goes through. The, my last example of material behavior is materials in between. So these are materials that can behave both like liquids and like solids. And that depends upon how fast you try to change their shape and by how much you try to change their shapes. As I said, shapes change because atoms and molecules move out of their earlier positions in order to adopt new ones. And they keep constantly flowing in between these different positions if they are fluids. If you change the shape too fast, the atoms and molecules can't keep up even in a liquid and they resist that change. This is the property of solids, of resisting a change in shape. But if you do so slowly enough, then they flow smoothly if they are liquids. But exactly what happens in a situation where you have different types of molecules and atoms together depends upon what those atoms and molecules are, how their shapes are, and how these shapes change when you impose a change of shape upon whatever it is that contains them. So here is one example. So here is a swimmer swimming. You can, you can all of you, I'm sure, have, have, have tried getting into a swimming pool and, and swimming like this. Some of you may even be championship swimmers. So you know what it takes in order to swim through water. Here's an example of someone not swimming, but falling through a different fluid-like medium. So this is a, a skydiver falling through and going to, towards the ground from, from a great high up in the sky. Here's an example of a skydiver with someone tightly bound to them falling down, but now it appears as though they're going to fall into a liquid, into, into the water, a large reservoir that you can see below them. And now you can ask the question, all of these examples here are people who have parachutes. You don't see the parachute in this particular example here, but the person has a parachute and it's a parachute that ensures that they come down very gradually as they come and hit the ground. So now the question is, without a parachute to slow you down, what would happen if you jumped into an ocean or a large body of water from an airplane that was very high up. The answer goes back to the fact that if you try to change the fluid, the shape of fluids very fast, and here by shape of fluid, I mean the fact that the water must flow around you as you hit the water with high velocity. That's a fast change of shape because I've now dug a little hole out of it and I have to push the water out somewhere. The water responds to that, but it has to do this very fast because I'm hitting it at high velocity. So it responds very much like a solid, very little like the liquid that the swimmer is actually encountering. So the, answer, the short answer is that this is not a good situation to be in. In fact, it's almost like hitting concrete. In this particular example of the person hitting a concrete uh, uh, road here, it's very like that. Hitting water at high velocity, the sort of velocity that you would have, you jumped out of a plane at a considerable height and you didn't have a parachute on to soften your, to slow you down as you reach further and further down it will really break every bone in your body. So let's get to my soft and squishy examples. And this is my example of tomato ketchup that we started out with. Here's a cartoon of start from the left, goes round like this. This is a person who is thirsty, walking, is, is crawling through the desert, sees a bottle of tomato ketchup, picks it up, tries to push it into their mouth, shakes it, it's still not coming out, shakes it, finally dies of thirst. So this is the two skeletons that you see at the bottom. And at that point, the ketchup bottle opens up 
and a bit of the ketchup falls out. So this is an example that I'm sure many of you, especially from the older ketchup bottle, the older generation will have seen before. This is this extreme reluctance of ketchup to get out of the bottle that is contained in. And this is solved in modern ketchup bottles and it's solved in many interesting ways, but that's certainly something to remember. So why does ketchup do this particularly interesting thing? The reason is that the tomato sauce, tomato ketchup, holds together, it doesn't move, it's solid like if I don't do anything to it. When I shake the bottle, the links that hold these molecules of sauce together, basically it's to tomato sauce, is tomatoes mashed up in particular ways, the bits of sugar, bits of liquid added up, give it that particular consistency that you know about it. But it's also cross-linked, it also has pectin inside it. It's cross-linked, which means that the molecules are tied together in a particular way that encourages them not to move if I'm not forcing them. By shaking the bottle, I have disrupted the contacts between these molecules, and then these molecules can flow freely, like a liquid. And that's when the sauce moves like a fluid, and it comes out of your bottle. There's a technical word for this, it's called thixotropy, although that doesn't really add much to what we know about this. And the description is exactly as I have told you. This is something that behaves like a solid, like a gel. When I don't put a force on it, I shake it vigorously, I push it down like this, then it begins to flow much more easily. It begins to flow like a fluid. My second example is the example of toothpaste. So all of you again, this is an example that is familiar to all of you of toothpaste here. And let me now describe to you that toothpaste is actually a very interesting fluid. It behaves like a solid at rest inside the tube. I can take my toothpaste up, hold it upside down here, and the toothpaste will not flow. If I took water inside, filled it up inside my toothpaste tube and held it up there, the water would flow outside. So it's very different from being water-like, very different from being fluid-like. At rest inside the tube, it behaves like a solid. So even when I remove the cap, it will not flow out but it will only flow out when I squeeze the tube from the inside. By squeezing it, I've created a pressure difference between the end with which I squeeze it and the other end. And as the fluid moves, as the toothpaste moves through the tube, it changes its shape. And as it changes its shape, it responds by becoming more fluid-like. But then once it's on your toothpaste again, it goes back to behaving like a solid at rest. So when I attempt to change its shape, it becomes like a fluid. When I remove that, it behaves back like a solid. And that's very important. If I took a toothpaste, if every time, every time I tried to put a toothpaste on a toothbrush and it just flowed off from the bristles of that toothbrush, that would be no use at all as a toothpaste. So this is an example of something that is called a yield point. There's a minimum force that I must apply to the toothpaste tube so that it starts to flow. And that's shown by these two weights that I've applied on the toothpaste tube. For a small weight, there is not enough toothpaste. There is no toothpaste that comes out of the tube. For a large weight, that is the toothpaste begins to come out, begins to flow outside. So the idea of the yield point is that there is a certain minimum amount of force that I must apply to the tube before the toothpaste starts to flow. And then before that, it is solid-like. After that, it becomes liquid-like. So this is called yield stress or a yield point that I apply to the fluid. The use of toothpaste is that, of course, that bacteria pile up on your teeth every 12 to 14 hours. And the toothpaste is used to make your brushing of these bacteria off more effective. First of all, because they contain abrasive materials, and these abrasives remove the stains without damaging your teeth. Toothpaste foams, and this is a foaminess that we like. We see this when we have, you know, when we sort of look around, look at ourselves in, in a mirror. They foam because they contain detergents, otherwise known as surfactants, which is another type of cleaning and bathing. And the role of the surfactant is to loosen and break down oily substances that exist on your teeth and around them that would not otherwise be dissolved in water because they don't mix well with water. So they soften them, enable them to come off, and so that you can rinse them away when you use water, when you brush your teeth. There are many other ingredients that go into making a toothpaste. There are ingredients that keep them from separating. A toothpaste is made up of many different types of ingredients, and they must all be held together in the same consistency. So there are binding agents that hold these different parts together. If it didn't have these agents, they would dry up. The toothpaste would lose its water content very fast, or it would require some sort of stirring to put it to go back into a soft, pasty type of state. The final part, of course, is flavoring. And that's what makes the difference between neem toothpaste versus Colgate toothpaste versus any other toothpaste that you prefer over something else that you dislike. You go to toothpaste because you like their texture, you like their flavors, and you like the fact that they do presumably a good job of cleaning your teeth. <clears throat> My second example of soft and squishing is an example that I hope all of you 
appreciate. This is an example of ice cream. Ice cream is a complex fluid. It contains water, sweeteners, flavors, emulsifiers, stabilizers, milk fats, and milk solids. All of this goes into determining the consistency and the taste of ice cream. And the reason that all of this complexity is required is because ice cream combines two liquids that don't naturally mix. They have liquid particles of fat that are spread through a mixture of water, sugar, and ice with air bubbles inside them. And that's what all of this gives it its consistency, its very characteristic ice cream consistency. Fat doesn't milk, mix well with water, and the fat content in ice cream has the tendency to separate out. In addition, there are bubbles of air and ice crystals in water. All of this is made up, is, is interlinked with a network of globules of fat. So ice cream is really ice, bubbles, ice crystals in water, together with the fat and other types of flavor. What you need to do to, stable, to make the fat stable is to add something called an emulsifier. And so this prevents the droplets of fat inside the ice cream from clumping together. So they act like sponges, they absorb and they lock in space these, these droplets. And then you have the liquid term that added onto that. So you must have both the liquid and the fat droplets, but you must not have the fat droplets getting together. So you have the surfactants preventing this aggregation. Stabilizers help to keep the material uniform, keep the texture especially very creamy, and prevent the formation of large crystals of ice. Ice cream contains small ice crystals, but for those of you who've had bad ice cream, will know that there's often a little pain involved when you bite into a crystal that is hard and that damages or hurts the roof of your mouth or your tongue. So the secret with good ice cream is to make sure that the ice crystals don't grow too large, that they remain small in order to give it that crunchy sort of flavor, but they're not allowed to grow large enough that they can actually hurt someone who's eating them. There's a lot of sugar that goes into ice cream, it's usually sucrose or glucose, the cold of the ice cream numbs your taste buds and makes them less sensitive. And then you have to add extra sugar in order to get the correct flavor of sweet ice cream. What this means is that if I remove the sensation of cold altogether, I just have my ice cream at room temperature. I, I, I melt it so that I can have it at room temperature. It tastes oversweet. And that, that sweetness is required. The excess sweetness is required because you normally consume an ice cream at a lower temperature where it tends to be solid rather than at higher temperature, where it's room temperature, where it is liquid. And your taste buds are not, not, not deadened by the cold. The final point, of course, is about the ice crystals that form in ice cream. So they're important to the quality of ice cream. Soft serve ice cream, which is the example that I showed you earlier, the wiggly ice cream that went up there, needs very, very small ice crystals. So they need to be frozen fast. These ice cream need to be frozen fast. However, it's still about 60% water. Not all of it is frozen. And that's because I've added enough chemicals to it to prevent all of it from exclusively freezing. Little pockets of, of water remain in this background of ice. That adds to the scoopability of the ice cream. So sometimes I must take ice cream and leave it outside for a little bit in order to have the, a little more melting inside, make it easier to pick up and transfer to a cup. So that's the complexity that goes into making something as simple as ice cream, which as I said is soft and squishy. Here's Another example. So this is the example over here. So I'm going back to the same example that I used earlier. And here, at least the outer year that, that you will see here, has two major components. One is a somewhat hard component. That's this part here. That's made of cartilage. It's a type of material, a biological material called a cartilage. And there's also soft tissue that envelops that cartilage. And the year, and, and the year lobe here is made up of soft tissue. It's basically only cells. There are blood vessels that innervate them. There are, there are nerves that innervate them. But there's no bone and no cartilage that, that, that supplies this particular area of your ear. This is interesting because the earlobe has no cartilage, has a large blood supply. It's highly elastic. As I said, you can twist your earlobe in various complicated ways. And it goes back to its old position here. So as I said earlier, this is an example of a soft, living, self-repairing material, and anyone who's had a, a, a earring hole put in knows that you have to keep that earring hole open, otherwise your ear will wound repair and excise that hole, will remove that hole in a period of a few months. Here is an example of the sort of pressure that you put your, your ear to. Every night you lie down, you lie down on your ear typically. Often that ear is twisted up in funny positions, and you do this for 80 years into 365 days, into, into 12 hours each that you typically spend lying down. And this is a very large amount of force that needs to be applied. This applies perfectly well, even if you were sleeping on a hard, let's say a train, a train, um, train um, compartmental uh, uh, 
thing where you lie down. So you're here, this little example, not even a particularly interesting biological example, is still an example of, of a whole lot of complexity of materials. The fact that you can make solid, growing, living, bendable, flexible materials using biological components. The, again, the example here is, even with this, over long enough times, you can deform it. So that's the example of people who wear heavy earrings, often for reasons of, of, of cosmetic reasons. And these earrings, given enough time, will pull down on the ear, creating a much larger hole and distort or deform the old structure of the ear. So this is a material that can go and heal, but it can also flow. And it's a biological material that flows very slowly. It started off as a small ear lobe and now has become a big, long, distorted ear lobe. So it has actually flowed, even without ruining all of its earlier properties of being living, soft, malleable, and can, and which you can change its shape easily. Here's my last example, and that's, you can see, this is an example that every mother and father fears. This is a kid going down with a cold, and you can see the mucus that is coming out of this child's nose. I wanted to talk about this example from a different point of view, and I wanted to talk about it from the example point of view of the new coronavirus of COVID-19 that causes COVID-19. And I tried to leave the coronavirus out of this particular talk, but I thought this would actually is an interesting example that goes to illustrate some, some of the features of soft materials very well. So the new coronavirus is very tiny. It's actually much, much, much smaller. It's so small that you cannot see it with your naked eyes, certainly. You cannot even see it with a regular optical microscope that you might get into a lab. You need very special microscope in order to see the structure of the coronavirus. When, you when people talk to each other, when someone who's ill with, the, with, with COVID-19 talks to someone, they produce little particles. And these are produced by people when they breathe, when they talk, when they cough. They're largely very, largely invisible to the naked eye. And they're able to float in air, provided that they're small enough. These droplets are very largely biological fluid. They contain the contents of your throat, of your chest, of your lungs, et cetera, et cetera. And a generic word for this, the stuff that, that comes out in this example here, is, an exa is a word called mucus. And mucus can carry little particles of the coronavirus inside them. Mucus itself is largely water. It's 95% water, 3% protein, the protein which is called mucin. The protein for our purposes is just another chemical, another molecule. It contains antibodies, which is your body's response to an infection contains some amount of salt and contains other substances, dead cells, as well as little pieces of coronavirus. Mucin is an interesting polymer. It can absorb water to, so that it swells to many hundred times its original size within a few seconds of its release from glands that produce mucus. These strands then, once they expand, cross-link. They tie together chemically to form the sticky elastic gel that is the stuff that is coming out of that kid's nose. So what happens when someone with the coronavirus who is infected with COVID-19 begins to sneeze or cough? So as we understand it, what happens is that the, the many droplets that they sneeze out or they cough out, they spread droplets of saliva and mucus together. And inside these droplets are contained little pieces of the coronavirus. If the pieces are small enough, they can be suspended in the air and they can stay in the air for a long time. The larger they are, the heavier they are, and the more likely that they will fall to the ground. So if they're larger than, let's say, a few microns in size, a micron is, is one with six zeros before it and, and a decimal point. So it's a very, very small number. It's much smaller than, it's much smaller certainly than you can actually see. So small particles, small droplets, they stay in the air for a while. Big droplets fall down to the ground. The small droplets that stay in the air for a while are really what is believed to be responsible for the coronavirus passing from person to person. And talking, sneezing, et cetera, these are all ways in which you convey these particles containing coronavirus to the outside world. So here's an example of someone who is infected with the disease but may not know that they had it, so they are asymptomatic for the disease. You can imagine them talking to someone who doesn't know that they're ill, that someone is wearing a mask. These are healthy people that you can see on the right-hand side. And you can see this cloud of little particles of droplets containing mucus, but mucus containing coronavirus, that they're spitting out. If the person wore a mask, that drastically reduces the number of coronavirus particles, the number of mucus droplets that this person emits. Whereas initially, the infected and the healthy people, if they were close enough together for the droplets to be transferred from one person to one person, then the person to the right could be infected 
where the droplets of the person to the left is emitting. If they're both wearing masks, the first of all, the mask has to penetrate, the, the, first, the droplet has to penetrate the first set of masks worn by the lady to the left, but then they must enter the mask of the gentleman to the right. And the further apart that they are from each other, the smaller the cloud of droplets that surround the infected person, the less risk there is, which is why wearing masks is such an efficient way for being able to deal with the coronavirus and to reduce your chances of actually catching it. So that's pretty much all that I had to say in this talk. So let me go through the examples again. We started off on the left with soft serve ice cream. We tried to discuss a little bit about what determined the texture of the ice cream. As you can see, as you hold it up, the ice cream behaves like a solid. The shape isn't changing of that solid-like structure. But I know that if I can, I can run my finger through it, and if it's soft enough, that finger will come off. And I have managed to change the shape of that. That's because it has air inside it. It's basically a lot more fluffy, but it has air, it has droplets of oil, it has water, it has little crystals of ice. It has stuff that holds these different components together. It has a whole lot of sugar inside it. All of this is required to give you that sensation of ice cream. And it must be cold enough so that your, your, uh, the, the, the receptors inside your tongue are numbed to the sensation of sweet. The second example was tomato ketchup. And there the example was you take a bottle of ketchup, try to squish it, to push it out. And it doesn't flow all of that easily. And you have to shake it quite a bit before it begins to flow. So what goes into making materials like that? What determines their properties? And how do I design bottles of ketchup, for example, through which it doesn't want to stick and wants to flow out? That would be one way of thinking about how to improve the old ketchup, certainly. The third example was the example of toothpaste. And as again, as I said, toothpaste has under several circumstances to behave like a solid and then other circumstances to behave like a liquid. I don't want it to behave like a solid in, in, uh, when I squeeze it out because if it was solid, it wouldn't be squeezed. It would just stay there like a lump inside the tube. So in order to come out of the tube, it has to behave like a liquid. In order to be squeezed out of the tube, it has to behave like a liquid. But when it's inside the tube and I'm not putting a force on it, it has to behave like a solid. It should not gradually come out of this, just as though if to a water and flowing out. Also, once I put it on the bristles of my toothbrush, it must stay there and it must not again, just limply fall over or, or, or like a fluid come out of the toothbrush. It must stay there like a little piece of solid right at the top. I use the example of the year to illustrate an example of a biological example. And there are very, very large numbers of biological examples which involve soft and squishy things. Your skin is one example, your tissues, your connective tissues, your fingers, your ear lobes. There's a lot of stuff and even further inside, even at the level of individual cells, they're going to make you up. These cells are soft and squishy inside. And a lot of the properties as we understand them have to do with their softness and squishiness. The example of the ear lobe was an example of something that is living. It generates itself. It grows from being a child when you're a child to being an adult. It has blood inside it, so it actually is supplied with nutrients. Cells grow, cells die inside it. But then I can also distort and deform its shape by wearing a heavy earring that pulls it open. And this is an example of something that, is, that stays living, even though it sustains very substantial distortions. The last example I used was the most topical example of them all, and this had to do with the coronavirus. And the example there was mucus and the droplets that you exhale if you're infected with. I, I, you could even happen if you had a bad cough, if you had the regular flu. But right now, for us, the particular example where it's important is in the context of COVID-19. And the fact that the disease appears to transmit through people through very strong, small droplets. This is very a different sort of disease in a sense from what we were worried about earlier, precisely because small droplets can stay in the air for a long time. And then someone who passes by a few minutes or 20 minutes later can inhale those droplets and potentially fall in. Which is why, again, it's important to wear masks, for everybody to wear masks, both if you're ill as well as someone on the other side if you're healthy, to make sure that you don't ingest these little particles of mucus containing coronavirus that float around that are normal part of exhalation, sneezing, even normal breathing, as you would. So the point that I wanted to make is that soft and squishy materials are all around us. Wherever we look, we may be biased by the fact that a lot of stuff, the desk, the computer, the lights, etc., these look hard to us. But look a little further and you will find the soft materials that underlie all of them. And you will understand why it's so important to think about soft materials because they really form the foundations of all of biology and a lot of the interesting aspects of chemistry, the soft materials that chemistry comes up with, the toothpaste, the, 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 the ice cream, all of this really relies on our understanding of soft materials and our ability to engineer soft materials. So just spare a moment to think about how remarkable they are. So let me thank ICTS, let me thank my host for this invitation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you.
Thank you, Gautam. Uh, let's all express our gratitude to Gautam for his very nice talk. Uh, so we're open for questions. People can type in their questions either in the YouTube chat box or in the Zoom chat box. There are already a couple of questions. I'll read them out and Gautam can take them. So the question from Navish. Yeah, uh, if you have questions for people on Zoom, please raise your hand. I'll come to you one by one. So there's a question uh, from Navish Wadwa from uh, on YouTube. And so Gautam, the question is, what role does mucin have on the evaporative stability of aerosols? Does mucus in droplets make them last longer in the environment? Lovely question. There's a lot that we don't know, and it's probably they contribute to stability in some way. And again, just to expand on that question, uh, the, these droplets are largely water. So one thing that happens to them is that the water evaporates and gradually concentrates the material that is inside. The coronavirus is an enveloped virus, that it has a little a little uh, cover around it that is made up of what are called lipid molecules. These prefer to be in water. The Once the water dries up, they don't survive very well. In fact, they die very fast. So one way for the virus to die is just for these droplets to evaporate, leaving just the contents behind. Usually, anything that you, that you add to, to a liquid stabilizes it. So the mucin is expected to stabilize the, the, the droplet to some extent, although we really don't know in detail what happens. But there are, evaporation is certainly one part where the evaporation concentrates the, 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 the materials inside this. One, as I said, one, one offshoot is that it tends to expose the coronavirus to the elements. It tends to deprive it of water and that is expected to break it up. But that's a good question. Okay. Uh, Vivek Tonapi on, on uh, Zoom, please unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, hi, my name is Anushka. Um, I recently tried experimenting. Um, so I mixed one cup of corn flour with one fourth cup of water and I got a substance which is known as oobleck. It's a non-Newtonian fluid. So I tried punching it with my fist, but it acted like a solid. It didn't stick to my knuckles. But when I dipped a finger into it, 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 uh, it sort of like climbed onto my finger and it was, it, oozed all over my finger. So can you please explain the structure of this, whether it's soft or whether it's squishy or, or what molecule it's composed of? Thank you. So, so I, I, I didn't use this word in my talk, but I, I sort of left it a changing shape, etc. The right word to use here is viscoelastic. So as I said, liquids respond in different ways depending upon how fast you try to change the shape. So if you try to change the shape very fast, for example, you, you, you slam down on your mixture of, of corn flour and water, you're trying to affect a fast change in shape of the liquid, it responds like a solid. So if you go on YouTube, you or any of your friends can see, look, you can see these examples of videos in which you have people who make large tanks of corn flour and water together. And then they show that you can run, actually run across it. So if you do that fast enough. So you're not ever contacting the, the, the liquid fast enough for it to change shape substantially during the period that you do that. So over a short time scale, it behaves like a solid. But if you just stand there for a while, your feet will sink down into that. Because it's like a liquid. It's like standing in water. The water molecules flow around your feet and, and now enable your feet to actually fall inside it. So the right word here is viscoelastic. And, and viscoelastic liquid depend upon the time scale at which you try to disturb them, try to change their shape. If you try to make the change of shape that is fast, they respond like solid. If you do this very slowly, they respond like liquid. So the whole, this is a very nice example that you had of, of a mixture of, of, of corn flour and water. That's, and that's a sort of an example that has many, many applications. This is a particularly simple and visual and direct example that you can try out in your home for this, but it has many, many other interesting applications. Thanks, Gautam. Uh, there's a question from uh, YouTube, Manmeet Kaur. Uh, the question is, uh, could it be said that when the person, as a person grows, uh, his or her body is essentially flowing in an irreversible fashion? So it's growth flow. That's paraphrasing. <clears throat> in, in, in sort of words, you could say that, but it's certainly much more complicated. Because remember that you grow from essentially one fertilized cell when the sperm and the egg get together into something that has a huge number of cells of order 10 trillion cells at the end. And so it's not just flowing because the flow implies that I have the same set of, of, of atoms and molecules in the beginning and I just make them change their shape. These cells multiply. They start off from this one cell to become very large numbers of cells. So growth there really 
necessarily means the multiplication of the cells. There's also the fact that cells take on very specific roles. There are cells that belong to your kidneys, cells that belong to your heart, cells that belong to your fingers, your epithelial tissues, etc. So as you grow, as you grow from that very, very simple initial condition of your being just one cell to start out with, that was your, your, the sperm and the egg uniting together, to the much more complicated thing that you have. There are many, many, many processes that happen involved. There are processes in which some parts of your body have to become hard, your bones, your teeth, for example, and some parts of them remain soft, for example, your skin. So all of these, the way the body chooses to make some cells specialize in particular ways, some cells hard, some cells soft, changes it, all of this goes. So it's not as simple as flow, although certainly the ability of body tissues to change and to morph and to move around and for cells to change their position is very important. So that certainly is flow. It's certainly not the whole story. There's another question from uh, YouTube, Ajay S. Um, so the question is, can we my, make cars using flexible materials so that we can avoid car accidents? <clears throat> I mean, it, it, potentially you could. I don't think there's anything that prohibits that. The question is how flexible. And in a sense, you're already making cars flexible, even though they seem hard to you because they're designed so that they crumple up in the front in, in, and, and sort of and, and prevent uh, and absorb a lot of the, the force of the collision just in the way that they're actually designed. If you made it too flexible, you might sort of squish yourself completely if you, if you rammed into a wall. So in a sense, you have to be, there has to be some part of the component that has to be hard. They have to be thermally resistant because your engines get hot. You, after all, you, do, you are um, burning petrol inside these. So, so the, the question is how soft do you have to make the soft in order to make it to have exactly the same functionalities as a regular car has and, and not do anything very different. But I think soft interpreted in a very broad sense, the fact that car fronts buckle when they slam into a wall or slam into another car is already incorporated in some sense into that. Okay. Uh, Siddharth, you can unmute yourself. Please ask your question. Thank you. Uh, you have actually uh, talked about the trouble. We cannot okay. hear you. A little louder, please. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you had actually talked about the uh, problems of getting ketchup out of the bottle and you said that there were a lot of uh, design changes and things like that. Can you please elaborate on that? So one design change was to make the inside of the bottle, um, to, to, make the, to make it so that the, the molecules of the tomato sauce did not stick to the inside of the bottle. One problem was that if they stick close together to the surface, then they find it harder to flow when we put a force onto that. The other was to change the nature of the nozzle that comes out. You can see that the modern Heinz bottles, et cetera, your ketchup flows much more easily to that. I was talking more about homemade ketchup as well as the old bottles of ketchup that many of us grew up with. So right now there's a lot of technology that goes into designing ketchup bottles in such a way that ketchup flows much more smoothly out of it than earlier. So it's much less of a problem now. So the redesign of the nozzle, the redesign of the, of the nature of the, the chemical nature of the interior surfaces of the ketchup bottle, all of these have gone into, into making uh, the ketchup bottle, making it easier for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Okay, uh, the many questions coming up. I, I probably won't be able to take so many. Uh, uh, so there's one more question uh, from Soma Kapoor. Uh, can elastic materials have more than one natural shape so they can be continuously deformed into without turning plastic in the process? Huh. The answer would probably be yes. It's certainly possible to design materials that would do that. <clears throat> you could have something that you know would sort of would like be like this or, with, or or in this particular form, and the space in between where there was straight was was an unstable position in between. So that's certainly true. My, my comment about being elastic, wanting to return to its original state, is really a statement about small changes about that original state. So if something that's already bent, and I try and unbend it, and it's, and it's a solid elastic material, it will try to go back here. But if I unbend it fast enough, it might find a new state that it was happier with, when it want, might want to move to that state. And now about that new state, it will be harder to change its position. So whenever I talk about elasticity, elastic materials, I always have, want to imagine that I'm going to change them, change the position very slightly, change the shapes very slightly, and watch them come back. Anytime it gets to a larger change of shape, anything can happen. And as you said, you can certainly design a material which has two different shapes altogether and, do, and can choose either one or the other depending upon how I deform it. Thanks. Um, yeah, there are a couple of questions on uh, shear thickening and shear thinning. So, for example, one question is, is blood a shear thinning fluid or a shear thickening fluid? And what is shear thickening? What is shear thinning? 
<laughs> so as I said, so I've been using very imprecise language so far. I've talked about changing shape, making fluids change shape, et cetera. There's a proper language to talk about it called shear and shear rate. The rate at which, so a shear rate is roughly the rate at which I change the shape of a liquid. That's just a technical, the, the technical way of, of describing it. As a function of shear rate, I can say how much force does it take to achieve a certain rate of shear rate, a certain rate at which the shape is actually changed. And if that goes up linearly, like a straight line, as a function of, of, of the rate of, of change of shape, then this is a regular, what's called a regular Newtonian liquid. If it tends to become smaller and soften out, that means that for large rates of change of shape, it isn't responding as badly or as, as strongly as it did earlier. So that would be the case of, 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 of sheer thinning material. If, on the other hand, it became harder and harder to deform, the faster the rate at which I tried to change the shape, that would be sheer thickening. The cornstarch example was an example of sheer thickening. As I remember, blood is an example of sheer thinning, and a lot of liquids are sheer thinning, and not can't bet on it right now. But um, certainly, the ability of cells to change shape in blood flows is very important. Your red blood cells must pass through tiny capillaries many, many times. They must have very large changes in shape. So that goes back to thinking about the importance of shape changes in biology. And that's a very concrete example that happens all the time inside your blood. You have your, your, your red blood cells changing shape by 30 to 40% as they move through these capillaries. So to come back to your original question, I mean, shear thinning and shear thickening in these examples is just the resistance provided by the fluid to the rate at which you change its shape. If that resistance tends to saturate, that is a shear thinning liquid. If the resistance goes up as you, as you increase that rate, that's a shear thickening liquid. If it basically increases smoothly, that's a regular Newtonian liquid with a simple viscosity. Um, a question from Aman Mahajan. Uh, what kind of material is hair? Uh, what about wet hair, dry hair? So um, hair is hair is a protein. It's, it's, in, it's, it's, it's made up of a bunch of proteins. That's probably keratin is involved. I'm not 100% sure of what, what actually goes into hair. But these are basically protein molecules. And um, water, as I understand, wets the outside surface of the hair. So when you have a bath, you, what you're essentially doing is wetting the outside surface of the hair. And if the hair doesn't want to be wet uniformly. It forms tiny little droplets on top of this. That really is the extent of what I know about hair and, 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 and how materials respond to hair. Hair, the, the more interesting question is, um, if you have a lot of hair, which, which obviously I don't, then what happens? How does water manage to be held through within that, within that dense network of hairs? Is there anything special that comes when I have many hairs at high density together as opposed to a small number? But I really don't know enough about how water and hair interact together to be able to answer that question in any more detail than I've said. There's a bunch of questions trying to ask, uh, what about bubbles, wax, and host of materials? Are they solids, liquids, uh, the intermediates? Uh, so there's a long, large list of uh, such materials. Yeah, I mean, bubbles are, are sort of little bits of, of, of gas inside a liquid, and uh, they, they, they're they important in, in many industrial contexts. For example, they can they can attack machinery through, through a, a, a phenomenon called cavitation. Wax, I guess, is, um, is, a, is, is an organic material. And candle wax, again, is something that melts in interesting ways if you, if you apply heat to it. And if you, if you have a wick that runs through this, uh, the melting of the wax supplies energy that goes into the burning and keeps that candle burning. Beyond that, I don't have a sort of deep understanding of, of why these materials behave as they do. Often, most of these involve the detailed chemistry of these materials. So you have to understand what is the chemistry that goes into it, what is the boiling point, what is the way it flows, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So there's both. So the interesting thing about soft materials, soft and squishy materials, is that they involve both physics and chemistry at a very intricate level. Okay, maybe a last question. This is by Ashwini Chandrasekhar. Uh, she says, are solid liquids and gases just points that a material goes through, or should I really think of them as a continuous spectrum of states? Oh, that's a very interesting question. So you should think of the solid as certainly something that is unique and special, and it's not connected to anything else. The liquid and the gas are connected to each other. The liquid, it's, it's as though I take every molecule in the liquid and make it go very far away from every other molecule, and I will get a gas. So there are points at which a liquid becomes a gas discontinuously, and there are points at which you can, there are trajectories through which you can go very smoothly between a high-dense liquid to a low-density gas. 
So that's a difficult sort of slightly technical question to answer. It seems that the solid is certainly very different from the liquid and the gas, but the distinction between the liquid and the gas is a little more subtle. And in some, along, certainly along some ways of going between liquid and gas, there is no real distinction at all. Okay, so with that, uh, we can close the session. So first of all, we should all thank Gautam for a very nice talk. So you can clap or put up. Clap uh, virtually. Clap virtually. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. A very wonderful talk. Uh, thank you all for participating, uh, people who joined us on Zoom and also the people who joined us on the YouTube chat, YouTube uh, channel and also chatted with us. Thanks very much.